What I wanted to do today was talk about something um, at a, a slightly different level. We've been talking about very nitty-gritty things and particular details of particular projects. And when I was first asked to come and speak here, it was, it was really the idea that, well, okay, let, let's sort of take a step back and have a think about the broader strategies. And if you like, particularly, there's, there's this imperative around open data and all of the other things that are going on in our environment, both in higher education, in, in IT terms. Uh, there's a whole load of stuff going on right now that somehow we need to kind of take account of as we, as we develop and move on. But we haven't actually really said welcome to Loughborough University, so I thought I'd do that as well <laughs> with a picture. So um, Mark, Mark said a few words at the beginning, but um, I just wanted to say a couple of things about Loughborough University. So you, you've probably seen a lovely big campus very snowy today, um, but normally very green. And we're quite proud of our reputation for student experience. Uh, we're also quite proud of our sporting reputation. And what, why is this relevant? Well, if you think about all of the things that we've been talking about here today, um, there's, there's other strands of activity that are going on. So for Loughborough University, um, I said student experience is a big deal. Um, this year we're playing host to two Olympic teams and a whole load of the stuff that we do is, is going to be shaped by having those guys on campus and you know you, it would be it would be um, entirely appropriate to, to find that there's all kinds of outcomes that involve the university's research and teaching and learning that come out of some event that you, you might think in, inherently has no particular relationship to it. So that's, this is me just gently leading you into the next slide, which is a bit of cognitive dissonance. So I said, well, here we are. This is, this is us. This is us at Loughborough University. Um, who knows who they are? Who's, anyone seen them recently? Okay. So it's, it's the um, opposition party in the Polish parliament. And, and who would have thought, let's say this time a year ago, that members of a parliament in, in a major European country would be sat there holding up the, the anonymous mask, the, the Guy Fawkes mask? Very strange. So what I'm leading up to here is there are lots of very strange things going on right now. So another very strange thing, um, you probably can't make it out from the back, it says, Boffin's blog, Blast, Births boycott of publisher Elsevier. So, this is all about Elsevier's alleged dodgy business practices and things like the Research Works Act in the States, where they're essentially trying to take away the open access mandate. So, you know, this bats back and forth from time to time in the States. Maybe it will go through if a Republican government comes in, maybe they'll say, okay, yes, let's do that. Why are we giving this stuff away for free? So we're living in a world where we have particular assumptions and I think a whole lot of things are coming along that maybe challenge our assumptions. So this one is quite parochial. I'll come on to some uh, broader ones in a minute. But let's say the open access thing really comes to pass. Um, what are the implications of that? One of them is open access journals, the directory of open access journals. This is, this is going to be the mother load. This is the place that everybody's going to come to for access to all of those research papers, all those research outputs. Bye-bye, Elsevier. We boycotted them. They're gone now. And these, these are quite big changes. You know, this may never happen. Elsevier and, and the rest of them may turn around and say, oh, actually, you know, let's, let's do things differently. And I, you, you probably correct me if I've got this wrong. I think Springer are one of the sponsors of this. So it, it's not the case that we're saying necessarily publishers are all evil, but you know, there may be some quite sweeping changes coming along. We talked about um, repositories of research data, and I think it's maybe useful to draw a distinction between research data and, if you like, metadata. So it, we've got quite a lot of repositories that contain research papers, research outputs of one sort or another. There's a lot of metadata there that helps you find them. The actual research data isn't necessarily so easy to corral lick into shape and put on some sort of central system. Uh, some of the people that I'm working with are working in high performance computing, computational fluid, fluid dynamics. They have research outputs which maybe take 10 terabytes. That's a fair amount of space. If you're a central IT service, which is my background, someone comes along to you and says, oh, I could do with 10 terabytes for this one model, for this one piece of work. 
that's actually quite a big deal, but you know that they actually have 10, 100 of those models, and that's where it actually starts to cost some real serious money. So we can talk about, oh, well, institutionally we have priorities and we have plans, etc., etc. To actually achieve something that will let us store, and I'm not saying that all of the data we're talking about is on that sort of scale, but some of it is. So whether we are actually inherently looking to store data centrally or in some cloud service, etc., etc., maybe, maybe not, maybe we're looking to store metadata in some cases, maybe the data in some cases just isn't really feasible to store in some central place institutionally or, or around the country. And anyway, once we have all this data stored that's open, we will probably want to have something like RAW there, the register of, of open access repositories, so that we can actually find it and use it. And okay, <coughs> so here's David Willits uh, nearly a year ago saying you will make your stuff open. And I think we have to bear in mind that that's, that's a government position as well. So we talked about the Research Works Act in the States. Governments change. And we're, we're basing a lot of assumptions right now on a political decision by one government, which may well be overturned later on if this government fails, for instance. So here's another perspective on it. We're all, we're all sitting here saying, OK, I've, I've put my stuff out in open access journals. I've made my data available openly. Anyone can grab it and use it. A lot of the things that we're used to, this is maybe five years down the line, aren't there anymore. How do people find out that I've been doing this stuff? And here's an example of a chap who's been very successful at promoting his work, his impact, his profile, whatever you want to call it, using the internet. So this is an e-learning professor called Steve Wheeler. You can find him on, on Twitter as Tim Buck Teeth. And there's a clue, actually, because a lot of this isn't about, I have a formal web page on a university website that says, Blah, blah, blah is the professor of blah. Here are some research publications. Isn't it all great? This guy is posting um, a continuous stream of stuff on his blog. He's using social media. Is he the model for academics of the future? Maybe, maybe not. But certainly you, you will, I think, almost inexorably have to engage at a level that people aren't perhaps used to doing now. If open access becomes a norm, and if a lot of these traditional dissemination channels go away. So there's a particular example on this um, slide, which is him talking about a, a conference presentation that he did recently, which um, had 18,000 views of the slides within a, let's get it right, 48-hour period. So imagine, you, know, you turn up to a session like this, you deliver a presentation, your conventional expectation is you do it, you go away, it's done. This guy's had 18,000 people, plus or minus a few, some people probably came back and looked at it again, come and look at his stuff all over the world just from one presentation at one event. So you can see the, the network effect, the dynamic of having the internet here, of having these social media technologies, really potentially changes an awful lot about your, your potential for impact, how you get your message across, a whole load of stuff. And I should say, I posted a link to the slides that we're looking at now uh, yesterday evening. So I'm no Steve Wheeler. I don't get 18,000 hits on my slides. But I've already had over 100. So I'm sure some of you in this room have looked at the slides, saw them on Twitter last night, probably four or five, maybe a few more. So who are the rest? So those are all people who aren't here today. So I say I'm, I'm trying to get a, few, get a few ideas together here. Going back to the impact thing, and this is all very, very uh, vain. I'm searching here for myself on Google. And here I am. I, wow, this is great. I, I went into anonymous browsing mode, deleted my cookies, set my location to Okhtamukti, just in case it was inferring anything from, from my location in Loughborough. I'm two of the top four hits for me. This is great. So my, my profile is, is looking pretty good. I'm, I'm quite chuffed about that. And, and a little preview screen there is showing a blog post that I wrote about a another conference. This is all great. Next page. This is what you see below the fold. So it turns out that there's, <laughs> there's some other people that I share a name with. And, you know, this, this guy is probably mortified that I keep showing up when he Googles himself. You know, 
he must be sitting there thinking, this is making me really quite angry. Um, ho hopefully we'll never meet. Um, and, and again, Bing, uh, we, we Google things reflexively. Bing is a huge search engine, and in the States it has something like 35% market share. Not on there at all. There is another slightly dodgy character here, this uh, guy who's into cage fighting. That, that sounds quite interesting. That's not me. That's, you can probably tell from the picture. Um, but what if I search on Baidu? I, I don't actually speak Chinese. I could run it through Google Translate. We want to have an impact that's, that's global for important research. How do we know whether we're actually achieving it? And, and that's, I mean, I'm being slightly facetious here, but that's the question. That's the real question. Um, in terms of can you exploit social media, web 2, et cetera, et cetera, to get your message across, make your impact? Well, yes, you can. And, and there's actually some quite good examples. One I've chosen here is from the LSE. So the LSE have a group that's been looking at this specific question. How do people who are doing university-type research take advantage of all of these communication channels that have arisen over the last kind of five to ten years. So well, well worth a look. And my brief includes not just research related stuff but also e-learning. So I'm conscious that there are similar discussions happening around e-learning and there's a particular example I pulled out here which is this thing called MITx. I could also have pulled out something called Udacity and what, the, what these guys are doing is taking university degree courses, making the content freely available, and then awarding qualifications. They're only, if you like, badges right now, but they could turn into real qualifications later on. So we're talking about institutions like Stanford, MIT, that this is not Mickey Mouse stuff. Um, in terms of disruptive influence, this is really quite huge, particularly when you're thinking about, well, how do I find out that there is a course? Well, maybe I go to a site like Plas Central. I don't go to UCAS. I'm looking for stuff which is already out there in the open. <coughs> As a potential student, I can see what's out there. And I know this isn't particularly germane to, to research data, but it's the wider environment <coughs> that we're in. So you'll see uh, another factor in all of this, the economy, demographics, student fees, and people just thinking about, well, will I go to university at all? What sort of course will I take? And going back to the, the OERs, the open courses, the MITxs, maybe I won't go for a residential campus-based course. Maybe I'll go and take some modules. You know, I'll do a, an evening or a weekend here and there, and I'll build up a degree that way. Um, point being, universities rely on these guys for a lot of income. So we're there saying, ah, oh, research this, research that. A lot of income from students goes to subsidize the facilities used for research salaries of admin and support staff, academics, you name it. So it's all interconnected. Um, I'm from IT, so I'm very conscious that in IT there are some seismic changes going on. And, and this may be indicative of some of the stuff that the, the internet is going to foist on other parts of, if you like, the educational sphere. So simple example, <coughs> Apple's iPhone business is now bigger as a business than the entire business of Microsoft. And if you took the iPhone business away, the remaining Apple business is bigger than Microsoft. So somewhere down the line, Microsoft, which was this big monolithic thing, has been shrinking relative, relatively to, to Apple at least. And now Microsoft allegedly are porting Office to the iPad. So you're sitting there with your PC on your desk, and we were talking about accessibility of, of the data, the research outputs, the materials that you've used in your research projects. And, and right now, we're thinking about the files that you manipulate on your PC. If this world comes to pass, this post-PC world, as it's called, then you may be looking at the stuff that you had on the PC as a sort of legacy system. And you may have a, a PC under a desk in a corner somewhere, because occasionally someone says, you know, could you, could you get me that uh, access database thing, the one you know, the one we were working on three years ago, this is the only PC left now. So but this, is, this is interesting times, I think, particularly if you work in IT, because we have you know, certain expectations that people will have PCs on their desk. They'll probably run Microsoft Windows. Maybe this will stop being true, and perhaps quite soon. So here's another data point. Uh, Microsoft. 6% drop in revenues for the Windows division. This is 
interesting because Google uh, income is based on advertising, Microsoft income is based on Office and Windows. So why would they port Office to the iPad? Well, hello, I can see that the money coming in is reducing. So maybe we need to take a punt, see if it's worth it. So in, in my world, these things are re very real and pressing concerns, and we're trying to figure out what our strategy, right now we're trying to figure out what our strategy for the next five years should be, and it's quite easy to see that people using what we think of as conventional PCs now could be the, the power users of the future, um, people working in engineering, doing CAD models and things like that. If I just want to edit spreadsheets and, and word processing documents, PC, hugely complicated, massive overkill, maybe we'll all be sitting there with iPad 5s by then or something like that. Who knows? A um, lot of data point here, it's not just about Apple and the iPad. Um, the other big thing for me is uh, Google's Android operating system. And Android is on a lot of people's phones. It's also on competing tablets that compete with, with the iPad. And particular data point, 700,000 of those are activated every day. That's more children than are born on the entire planet Earth every day. There are more phones and tablets running Android activated than there are children born. So at some point, you can see where I'm heading with this, at some point they'll catch up and everyone will have one, perhaps. But this is, this is big stuff. So now, now pause. <laughs> so I've, I've kind of worked you up a bit there, perhaps, I don't know. Um, what I wanted to do for part two of this was just talk about a few of the things that we, that we have identified. And I said we're trying to sort of figure out what our strategy looks like for the next few years. So, Here's a few things that we have identified, and uh, I'm going to try and pull in some of the themes that we've, we've heard from earlier on in the day. Um, so we talked about things like cloud computing, and, and we talked about mobile devices, and here's an example that actually pulls all of that together. We're just launching our um, portal site. We're a few years behind the times. A lot of people have had these already. We've caught up. And one of the, the ways that we thought we'd catch up was by being mobile from the word go. So visit the site on your phone, get a mobile optimized version of it. And this site actually pulls in uh, Google services. We use Google Apps with our students. So on your <coughs> phone, you get your Gmail, you get your Google Docs and things like that. And so we've built that in. As an IT department, we're not saying, you know, cloud services are a bit scary, a bit threatening. We're not going there. We're actually trying to embrace them. And so much so, actually, that we got Google to come and do a street view tour of our campus. And anybody who has a, has a university with a big campus, get in touch with them, bring them in, and they'll be more than happy to do it. So um, this, this poor guy with this little ice cream trike, cycle around our campus for, I think it was four days. <laughs> it was quite busy. <laughs> and we also hosted a, a, a Google user group event. We're, we're just looking to organize another one. So the, the point being, we, we've tried to go from um, you know cloud computing, third party services as a threat to let's embrace them, let's talk to these guys and see what we can do together. And, and that's been very successful. So you know it's worth, worth a try. Um, in that particular case, something that I thought was very interesting in the context we're in today, this is student use of Google Docs. I think you're mostly probably familiar with Google Docs. It's uh, essentially Google's competitor to Microsoft Office. It's not a complete competitor. It's a handy way that you can scribble on shared documents, spreadsheets, presentations, and things like that. So our students on a typical day, at about 10,000 of them using Google Docs. That's 10,000 people who are just accustomed to, I want to scribble on a document, bring up a browser window, type, type, type. Incidentally, I can share that with anybody I want to in the entire world, subject to the policies that the domain administrator has set. So we're talking about where does the research data live? Let's imagine that this isn't students. Let's imagine it's staff. Where does the research data live? Maybe it lives in the cloud. Another question, is it open already? How do you know? Who, who are you sharing it with? And there are third-party products for, for Google's system. There are third-party products that will actually come in and, and audit that for you. But, you know, it's, it's interesting to consider. Um, so this is staff. We're testing this out with staff right now as well. The red line at the bottom are members of staff using it. We've only got a few people 
really playing with it right now. The blue line is people that they're sharing things with. So we've got maybe, I'll we'll say that's about 80 staff right now, and they're sharing with, ooh, it's about 270 people. And we didn't constrain that, so they can be sharing with somebody else who has a Google account. That doesn't need to be at Loughborough University or any other university. So in the university sector, we've painstakingly constructed something called Shibboleth, so the Access Management Federation. <coughs> and we've, we've gone through all kinds of hoops to connect institutional systems together with particularly publishers' systems, those, those people we were killing off earlier on. Um, so we, we've gone to all that trouble. But at the same time, in parallel, a lot of us are moving to systems like, like Google Apps, also like uh, Microsoft's Office 365, a, a competitor to what you've just seen here. And they have their own parallel way of managing identities and authentication. So there's, there's these two parallel things going on here. They don't really meet anywhere. Um, actually, are we on a red herring here? Are we, are we going up, up the garden path with our shibboleth approach to authenticating people? Maybe. Um, this, this stuff gives you the ability to collaborate and share in a way that you would really struggle to with institutional systems. And we were talking about the, the nitty-gritty of cloud computing earlier on, the Janet brokerage and, and related topics. So we've been doing a bit of work here with Janet and with a, a commercial partner called Logicalis. And it's about principally where does the stuff live? And we've, we've been talking about it as though it's an either-or decision. So I just wanted to, to show a couple of slides that illustrate that actually it doesn't have to be an either-or decision. So what, what we've built is uh, a prototype we call a hybrid cloud. There's Kit on campus, and we have a couple of um, pods, as we call them, a couple of um, sets of servers and storage. But we're also able to cloud burst, as the jargon has it, out to Logicalis's cloud. And, and the point about this, and there's many similar topics that are coming up in the UMF work, is we need a sort of, a sort of national grid, if you like. We need, a, we need a 13 amp plug, and all of the other things that we have for electricity, for gas distribution, etc., etc. We need those for true utility computing. Um, so the, the, the question is, can we take a, a load and just move it around. If we can do that, then we can be completely agnostic about where we're getting our cloud services from. And we can actually, you know, going, going back to the previous slide, we can say, well, okay, it's currently cheaper because of you know, power costs or cooling costs or what have you. It's currently cheaper for me to run this in-house or move it to industrial data center number two, which is actually on the Arctic Circle. And if it becomes more expensive later on, I'll just pull that back and do it in-house. So that, that's where the, the thinking is right now about these things. Um, is it so important to say, is it, is it cloud or not? Cloud can be your own stuff as well as third-party external stuff. That's really the message I wanted to get across. So I don't, don't have much more to say here, just a couple more things. Um, one of them is we're increasingly being encouraged, I think is the word I'd use diplomatically, to collaborate together as institutions. So. If people are funding you, they'll often fund you to do work together and perhaps not to do work on your own. And a particular example of this that I'm very interested in right now is something that we're doing uh, with Nottingham and Birmingham. This is through the Midlands Energy Graduate School. These guys have been doing research together and they've been training postgrad researchers together and they're just going into teaching now. And earlier on I said about how research and teaching and all of these other activities weren't necessarily siloed and separate. These are the same people. You know, last couple of years they've been working on postgrad research, research projects, you know, doctoral training and all of that. Same people are now saying, okay, now we're, we're moving into teaching master's degrees. And I was talking about MITx and the, the open courseware mm -hmm. stuff earlier on. Um, what we're talking about here particularly is things like folk working in small medium-sized enterprises, they want to do a bit of CPD, they don't want a traditional degree, they want to build it up by modules, they haven't got the time to go and sit down somewhere like this for a year or two. So these are real um, happening things right now, and I'm not pretending that Loughborough is somehow at the cusp or the forefront of them, but I think they're quite relevant in terms of the, the wider discussion. 
Um, we talked about high performance computing, just to reiterate, huge data sets. Um, we have a high performance computing system, we're just about to put a new one in. Storage on that system is, how can I put it, it's for stuff in transit. You do your job, you run your model, data is spat out. There is no room to keep it on that system. So, uh, without labouring the point too much, it's got to go somewhere. And I think the question is, does the institution, with or without help from its funders, present a research data service, a place which is truly scaled to the kinds of multi-terabyte, even petabyte data sets that people are, are playing with? Or are we looking at something that's perhaps a little bit more lightweight? It's about metadata management in most cases, perhaps. Um, so I'll close off in a second, but one last thing um, inspired by a recent trip to London. And our question to ask yourselves, are you Silicon Roundabout or are you, and I've unfairly picked on the University of Greenwich because it has that sort of Dreaming Spires quality to it, but, you know, are, are you Dreaming Spires or Silicon Roundabout? And I think it's quite, it's quite instructive to reflect on that one and think, well, you know, we, maybe we're one or the other, but where would we like to be? So that's me now. I'll, I'll shut up. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.